I'm struggling. All right, I think uh, Angela, yes, fantastic. Okay, I am now going, good morning Phoebe. I'm going to officially start the meeting again. Good morning everyone. This is the August 25th meeting of the elementary school building committee and seeing we have a quorum, I am going to officially start the meeting at 10.04. The first thing I need to do, as everyone knows, is just make sure everyone can hear and be heard. So I will call out names. Um, Jonathan? Good morning. Morning. Angelica? Good morning. Sean? Here. Paul? Present. Phoebe? Hi. Hi, welcome. Simone? Here. And Rupert? Yeah, I made it. <laughs> okay. Hi, Rupert. Welcome. Um, and I see the Danisco team is here. I think we all know them. So at this point, I'm turning over the meeting to Margaret. But one thing I want to make sure we do is, um, as I think everyone in town knows, this is the last meeting that Sean will be with us, um, much to everyone's dismay. So I want to make sure we give you a good goodbye, Sean, as you have had now at the Council and Finance. <laughs> Hasn't he received enough kudos? I mean, really? <laughs> just, just a huge, a huge thanks from all from all of us, Sean. And so in case we run out of time, just know that you've got it. <laughs> And before we end, I want to make sure that the date, Margaret's going to uh, take over now, but the date we've set for the September meeting date and time work for people because it's going to be an important meeting. So when we get to just checking calendars to make sure we are, we'll have a quorum for that and that that time uh, works for everyone. So Margaret. You're on with, I think that was where you wanted to start as well. And then, yeah. then then we go to Donesco. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I want to preface this by saying I may need to leave this meeting a couple of minutes early. Um, so um, I will definitely be following up. But in case you see me pop off, um, I have to get, a, get off of this call about uh, five minutes before 11. So, all right. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to share the agenda. Um, and then I'm going to share a schedule overview. And I apologize because I'm working with one screen today. So that means that I am. Oh, I need, uh, Kathy, I need you to enable screen sharing. Okay. Probably for Tim as well. Resume, hitting resume. Okay. You did it. This meeting is being recorded. All right. I think it's all set now. Okay. okay. All right. So just quickly on the agenda. So I'm going to give an overview of the schedule. I'm going to turn it over to Danisco, who are going to give a building design update and a site design update. We're going to uh, talk, sort of do a follow up on the recent sustainability subcommittee about the peer review process. And then um, there are comments and questions uh, from CPAC that are going to be discussed. As Kathy mentioned, the next meeting is scheduled for Friday, September 29th. Um, at that point, we're going to be looking at interim cost estimates. So it's an important meeting. Um, is there anybody in this group? I know Sean won't be with us, but is there anybody else in this group who cannot make that date? We just want to make sure we have a quorum. Friday, September 29th? Yes. At what time? I think it's at 830. Uh, hopefully you have a hold in your calendar already for it. Okay. We've kept it, unless I hear differently, 8.30 has been our time. Um, mm -hmm. We set it for 10 today because uh, Tammy and Allison indicated they could potentially make it if we started slightly later today. Okay. The right. time would normally be 8.30. Okay. And then uh, down at the bottom here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, CONCOM and planning board meetings. And then we do have a couple of invoices to review. Sean, I apologize, but in case I have to leave before we get to that, could you bring those up? Okay, so now Margaret, I'm going- Margaret, real quick, could, could you email them to me? I'm yes, I will, send, I will email them, the three of them to you right now. There's one okay. Danisco invoice and two of ours, okay? All right, so now um, I'm going to pull up um, a calendar uh, that's sort of a 
call it a three month look ahead, I guess, uh, for lack of a better description. There we go. And again, apologies, cause I'm working with one little screen. So can everybody see this? It's sort of a, a grid a matrix. Mm -hmm. okay, yes. Assume that's yes. So the, the way this is organized, I find this kind of a useful tool um, at this point in the process because there's there are multiple sort of activities going on. So I'm just gonna go through them line by line. It will not take very long. So first of all, the consultant teams line. So across the top here, these dates on line, this line three is the first week of each, first day of each week. So, um, you know, here we are today with this ESBC meeting. And I will also uh, mention that the funding agreement has been, uh, I believe, fully executed. The, the, ta the town has signed their piece of it and it is off to the MSBA. We're just waiting for the MSBA signatures to come back. So that's an important milestone to recognize. So in terms of what the consultant team is doing, um, the design development package is going to the estimators on September 1st, and that's a three week process. So we'll be getting those estimates back in late September and uh, here is that September 29th meeting that we talked about. So this line is the elementary school building committee. And then the week after that, in early October, we're going to be making the next submittal to the MSBA. Now, the good thing about that is that we don't have to have, unlike the earlier ones that were pre-funding agreement, you do not need to vote on that, but we will be reviewing the materials uh, with you at this September 29th meeting. Um, and then um, tentatively, we should um, plug in a meeting, I think in late October. Um, I tentatively am suggesting in the schedule that it could be November 3rd, but it could be the week previous. Um, Kathy, I'm not sure how you want to settle that since we don't have a the whole group here today. Should Is that a... Uh, well, I'm... I, I will just, Margaret, with these on the list uh, after the meeting, I'll double check with people on whether the third works for everyone, okay? So okay. tentatively, we'll say, it, we'll say it's November 3rd, and then I'll send out an email to find out whether that um, whether anyone has a conflict with that. Just sure. so people know that they, on my calendar, since I, yeah, the week before that would be October 27th, so um, yeah. if we did it the fr Friday before, so... Okay, so that's where the building committee is going to be meeting approximately once a month. Um, MSBA is funding agreement is being executed, and they will be in October into early November. They will be reviewing the design doc, de design development documents. They do a very detailed review and provide back as they have before a lot of comments. Although this time the comments are going to be on the on the, more on the design drawings than they are on program issues. Um, design review. So um, one of the important things that um, the design team is doing right now is confirming the list of any proprietary items with Rupert. So Rupert, we're gonna be after you about that. Um, there, we, there will be, these tentative meetings aren't scheduled, but I've sort of plugged them in so people could see there is gonna be a follow-up meeting with the town engineering departments to show design progress. Um, we will want to meet with the design subcommittee again on the exterior finishes. And then we will want to meet with the uh, school leadership initially on um, interior finishes and then present that with the district's commentary to the building committee meeting. So again, these meetings are not scheduled yet, but I just am where they're sort of out there and we'll be doing more to set them up. On per, on the permitting side, uh, Donna and Tim and Benny M will probably talk about this some more, but we are anticipating that the first con, the first hearing of the CONCOM uh, review will be uh, early November, November 8th is their first November meeting. So I see a hand up, Sean. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you may have done this already, but um, I strongly recommend meeting with the permit administrator. Um, 
probably in the next month or so to get a really good handle, if, again, if you haven't already, on all the different boards and committees that will review this. Um, yeah. You know, our, my understanding just with our other project is we have quite a few that have to, uh, the, the uh, drawings will have to go through and we'll have to review and sign off on things. So yeah. um, getting a really full understanding of all the different meetings and how far in advance things have to get to them and, um, you know, what their processes are and how often they meet. I think sooner better, rather than later would be better. Yeah. Point noted. We will um, do some follow-up. Kathy, you had a question? Uh, no, just to build on Sean's, um, I definitely urge that and including things like the kitchen, you know, different pieces of it will require uh, 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 a board I, of health. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's just, um, yes. And, and making sure that's go smoothly. Then my other question is, do we, when in this design process, do we have to go before the planning board is it after the various uh, subgroups have looked at it um so aside from other so, so is it it's just so, it's a pure question yeah so so the way that's why we do the permit administrator meeting all the permit agencies are in the room at the same time they all align their schedules they talk about who needs to go before who and uh, we just did it with the library for instance so yeah. if they haven't done it already that but they need the no and they'll say when the permits, when the applications are available and all that kind of stuff. The permit ad administrator is functioning as a sort of central cog in the process. Yeah, it so. includes fire, health, building, planning, conservation, everybody. Okay. okay. And, and I, I do want to add that we did have an initial meeting with, is it Jennifer Mullins? Uh, yes. Is, if I, forgive me if I got her name wrong. Um, no, you got it. And she was very helpful. Um, and we discussed it in over broad terms um, and, and we have an outline, but now as soon as this set of documents goes to our cost estimators next week, we are really going to um, and try to set all of those meetings up. Yeah, the, you know, I will say that the point at which the drawings go into the administrators, the design team does have a chance to take a deep breath and kind of organize the next step. So um, I that's when we'll be moving ahead with those pieces. But thank you, Paul, for the reminder. Any other questions before I turn? Oh, I wanna wel welcome Allison. Thanks for sneaking in there um i guess kathy do you want to ask the hear and be heard <laughs> just, thanks for um, allison just let us know you can hear us um and what margaret just shared i will put in the packet right after this um you know with with a circle around november 3rd that checking back but it it's the key things to know allison September 29th should be on everyone's calendar already. Mm -hmm. it is. Um, yeah. And November 3rd is the next potential one. So there won't be one in October. So that would be, um, and then I didn't see anything in November, in December. So it's uh, right now, two meetings in the fall un un until we hear differently of the full group. Um, so with, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Donesco. Exactly. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will uh, go through updates and what we will be submitting to the uh, cost estimator in a week, uh, based on discussions that we've had with the committee as a whole and the design and site subcommittee groups. Uh, can you see that? Starting with the site. So this site plan reflects the changes that we have made uh, throughout DD, including adding the pull-off parking spots at the drop-off area. Um, at the very beginning of DD, we added the band parking loop. We've made some adjustments to the outdoor learning spaces, um, uh, separating them for noise separation. We've made some adjustments to uh, the basketball courts, both the two that are together and the um, two half courts in a circle. Um, this represents the uh, soft surface play area, um, the design of the structures itself and how the space on that is allocated is a discussion that we will have uh, with school administrators going forward. Um, but this is the area south of the existing building. And also indicated on this plan in a faint line here that I don't know that you can see, but this represents um, where the PV canopies will be in the parking lot and you'll notice that they're somewhat aligned with the playground all because 
all of this is going to happen south of the existing building that will be demolished once the new school is open and having all of these features south of that line allows them to be operational on, on day one. Uh, so you will be at zero from the beginning with the PV and the playground will be there to serve the kids on the day that the school opens. Uh, Sean, do you have a question? Tim, how um, if we ever wanted to add more PV canopies in the future over that figure, the, the section that's above, um, would it be, is, it, is there a simple way to connect to the lower level and extend it? Or is there things we could do now to make that more easily an option in the future? Um, I could see that coming it, up it, in the future, trying to find additional places. And if we already have something set up and you know updated for that, that use, uh, that might be a good option. There certainly is the space to expand the PV capacity in the parking lot. And you're, you're really only talking about a third of the parking lot once you've used the entire roof and we're using the roof first because it's a little less expensive. So the equipment, uh, the inverters, the inverters that Kurt converts the DC power to AC that the building use is on the poles. So that can go anywhere. And then there are transformers and meters. Currently, we have that in a little utility area near the generator and the other things that are gonna to have to be on the site down here. Um, so the closer additional PV to that, the better, but um, that is a, a, a minor uh, in the grand scale of things uh, consideration. Uh, it is possible if it was a different system, this could be duplicated somewhere. Uh, but if, if that was a likely possibility, we would certainly plan for it in terms of the area uh, for the secondary services. Um, I mean, th that's a, a long answer to say, yes, it's possible, certainly. And two, if we think it's likely, we would plan for it. Yeah, if it's, I mean, if it's low cost to plan for it, I think it makes sense to plan for it, just given okay. you know, what our goals are. Uh, you know, Tim, just building on what Sean um, has said, you know, we're looking at this, uh, townwide in terms of canopies. Um, if you have the infrastructure for a conduit up by the field, which we've talked about, um, just would you potentially, if the additional canopies weren't directly linked to the school to offset its energy use, but we're going to be linked to another town building? I, I, I'm asking it as a question. That's another possible uh, electric in on our house yeah, yeah. yeah so we, so understood yeah. and, and and you know if we if we discuss all the permutations in terms of permitting you know who owns the power um you know it, it's a lengthy conversation but if it's if it's not directly connected to the school uh, some of the stuff that's down in this area of the site would probably be duplicated because it would be separately metered um, and as a part of the overall cost of the installation, that's minor, but um, but any one of those situations or scenarios that you mentioned are possible. It's just what best suits the town and, and honestly how you best want to pay for it. Thank you. And then one subtle change that we have not discussed in the... the um, site design subcommittee meeting or the larger committee meeting to this point is now that we are approaching DD and preparing for the CONCOM submission doing storm order calculations, um, it's barely perceptible in this drawing, but this space between the drive aisle and the parking lot itself has become two feet wider. Um, and that is to capture all of the water from the parking lot now that it has been determined what that flow will actually be and to make sure that the runoff from the new site um, is no more intense than the existing site. Uh, it was originally laid out with a good estimate and it turns out that we need just a little bit more volume in these spaces to capture and control that water before it flows into the culvert under the site. This feature is uh, at its deepest point, I, I believe an 18 inch depression. So it's it's not a, a retention, it's basically a planted island. And 
that move did move the drive aisle to the east, but it did not decrease the athletic field. What changed is this strip got narrower and the slope of it got a little bit steeper. It went from a five and one slope to about a four and one slope. So it's, it's, you can still comfortably walk up it, uh, but it, it, it's a little bit steeper here. Uh, Jonathan, have a question. Was it more more related to what we were talking about earlier? Um, not so much PV, but I can't remember how much we've talked about um, whether we're providing any EV charging stations as part of the parking lot design. Uh, we are uh, providing. So there's a, a lead point and then there's a code minimum with the opt-in and we are hitting both of those. And those are nine um, chargers. And then there's the capacity to um, expand to 18. That That is what is required by lead and code. Um, we have also had discussions about possibly providing additional conduit in the same flavor of um, potentially expanding the PV. But as of right now, we have the infrastructure for nine chargers and the conduit for 18. Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to clarify that we're not providing the chargers, correct, Tim? No, no, no. no we are not. That is the, with the town. Correct. That, we are trying the right. feeders, we're the planning. concrete pad. Right. Yes, sorry. Thanks. That covers the site and anything that we have not presented before any questions before we move to the building phoebe um can you just remind me or tell us now that uh the space in between the field and the drive is a little bit less can you tell me how many like what that is it's two feet narrower is that what you mean this is grass with a little bit of a slope um right how wide is that how wide is it? Uh, it's probably about it's about twenty feet from the sidewalk to where it becomes level, and you start playing. Uh, okay, thank where, you. Where, yeah, where it will be irrigated, it'll have the drainage under it, and it will be a level play surface. Allison. Al Uh, Allison, it seems like your the audio is not connected. I'm not sure. Is she waving us off? Yeah, there's a um. You can test switch to leave computer audio. So you might check your your audio settings. I think she's gotten out and is going to get back in from the looks of it. Okay. She's disappeared. Yeah, we don't have text set up, so she can't send us a message. So um, it seemed like she may have had a question about the site. So I don't know if we want to give her a minute or move on to the building. Okay, we can come back. To, I'll tell her she can also, yeah. Why don't you just keep going? She, she, she just joined. She just joined. Okay. I don't know if we can hear you, Allison. Do you want to text it? Do you want to type in a chat? Or oh, I don't know if we can do yeah, that. We don't, yeah. we don't have chat set up over. Right. Where the mute button is, is where you can see what kind of audio you're on. If you do the up arrow, it's uh, switch to phone audio, leave computer audio, audio setting. Um, or, or Allison, you can text me the question and I'll read it to the group. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? This is so we weird. We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Really? <laughs> oh, thank you, Kathy. You said the right thing. Um, sorry for the delay. <laughs> I just wanted to double check, maybe it was already stated. Um, I thought that there was going to be some type of coverage for the parking spaces farther away from the building. Um, 
I didn't know if that was my, I may have misunderstood, but um, I thought I had understood that, that there might be some coverage farther away. No, the, the coverage is closer to the building due to phasing. And I, I, I don't doubt that I misstated or, or stated it unclearly at some point, but the, the coverage is at the south end of the lot. And the reason for that is so it can be built while the existing building is still there. This drawing doesn't happen to show the existing building, but it's right. It's actually over the drive aisle and right up against the parking lot. So to build the parking lot and the canopies while the existing building is there would be um, problematic. But Allison, your memory is great because we did have a discussion about this in an early point and kind of incenting the further away parking spaces by having the coverage there. But it, as Tim says, it's changed because of phasing. So thank, good catch. Thank you for pointing that out. Maybe with that, moving, just quickly refreshing, moving through the plans. Um, the only changes that have been made um, are small and technical. Um, shaft sizes have changed. Uh, actually, the elevator has moved a few feet to get out of the way of some steel in the building. Um, but the program elements, um, are as they have been and as you have seen them um, numerous times before. Um, moving to the second floor, the, like another of the small changes that I've, the custodial closet here outside the library and by the stair has shifted um, the shafts that are taking air from the air handlers on the roof to the various spaces in the building have been adjusted some, uh, but the still layout is the same. And Tim, we've also, yes. Um, just go back on that. Um, I don't think at the full committee, um, it happened at a, a working group, the switch with the um, steam room being adjacent mm -hmm. to the library is on this diagram. And it was agreed that there isn't a door into the library for this. This uh, We had gotten a comment it because the two doors are right adjacent and the library needs all that wall space for uh uh, bookcases that happened in a meeting with the librarians, I think. Um, so I, I'm just in, I don't think we've stated that clearly for the full, full committee. Uh, thank you, Kathy. And that actually brings me to another point. Um, the library itself, there were some changes that were discussed in that meeting. Uh, previous plans have shown the circulation desk uh, against the workroom here. So you would walk into the library and be faced with the circulation desk and uh, the library proper would be to your right. Uh, in speaking with the librarians, they felt it would be better that the uh, circulation desk is right there as you walk in, it's on your right. Uh, you walk past it, do what you have to do there, transactions in terms of book, lookup station, and then beyond it, uh, the stacks, reading areas and classroom functions. And you'll see that uh, in, a, in a few minutes, we have some interior images to share. Thank you. Um, and then the other changes were, uh, you know, slight tweaks in shafts, uh, size of mechanical and electrical room. Um, looking at the west elevation, the main entrance, um, some changes that we discussed at the last Building Design Subcommittee, we've, at the administration, we've replaced the metal panels that we have uh, adjacent to the punch windows with uh, a patterning of masonry. Um, it's, it's a bit more subtle. It still recalls what you have at the um, classroom area, uh, but it's uh, sort of keeping in flavor with the front of the building and the more solid volumes. And it's uh, perhaps a little, or let's say it this way, that the uh, 
the main feature that we have as the canopy and the roof edge with a bright color uh, does most of the work on this elevation. Uh, and, and you'll see a little more of this as we have show the video that goes around the building. Um, we've also changed the material um, at the media center, at the gym and the music room that we were once showing as um, single skin metal panel to a masonry material. And we think that uh, in terms of cost and durability uh, and it achieves all the aesthetic goals that we want, uh, it, it's uh, the right decision. And that's what we've included for the DD cost estimate. Um, walking around the building, um, here you can see some of the uh, comments that we've incorporated. Um, the glazing at the music room is mostly higher up, letting more light into the room. We've in added a window at the stage area so that room can be used. And you'll see that more as we go around. We've extended the canopy as you leave the cafeteria vestibule. Uh, so there is 12 feet of coverage coming out of this door right now. Um, you can see where we once had single skin metal panel. We are now showing masonry material and breaking it up with some patterning. Um, you know, this is design development. It is not the end of the design process. Some of the tweaks can still be made throughout the design and final design, detailed design of the project. So patterns, colors, masonry, uh, we will still be uh, talking about that with you and, and refining as we get to uh, the end of the design process. Uh, here's an overall view of the northwest corner looking from the drop-off aisle with some of those refinements. Um, and then I will say that we do have a metal edge as we've discussed where these um, roof edges come to the ground at the canopy, the music room, and around uh, the library. Right now it's rendered as neutral at the music room and media center, but we do have the opportunity to, um, and we will be looking at other colors to tie it all together. Moving around to the other side of the building, here's a closer look at uh, some of the patterns that we are suggesting to break up the masonry facade at the main administration area. Um, even though these windows into these offices and conference rooms are right, quite large, uh, just with the shape of the building, the proportion of the opening to the masonry wall itself uh, sort of lends itself to some articulation of the wall. This much brick without any patterning or change of color would probably seem um, a bit large. Um, and then you can see here, um, we've changed the material at the... Uh, top of the gymnasium to uh, a masonry material. Another thing that you can see in this image is the screen at the uh, roof equipment on top of the gymnasium. Um, this will not be visible from the ground, but uh, to this point we've carried um, three air handlers and three energy recovery units for six total pieces of equipment and we've combined them into three units total with incorporated energy recovery. Those units are a little bit differently shaped. So this roof screen, um, if anyone noticed, has moved south a little bit. Um, we don't feel that it uh, you know, has a, a major impact on the design, but it is different than what you've seen in the past. So I wanted to point that out. Here's another look from the drop-off loop as one would be exiting. Uh, look at the uh, main administration room. Um, this is the roof screen and the gymnasium. And a closer up view of the gym. Jim, um, oh. what is the material what? over the, over the windows on the administration building? The, it looks, it's, uh, the pattern. So the pattern is, uh, brick masonry, if you will. Uh, it is um, different colors and we would anticipate reveals in and out of the courses uh, up to a half inch at a time. Um, you know, the pattern as we're showing here is not set and we certainly want to uh, review options with you. Um, but we feel that 
patterns and colors within the masonry itself can do quite a bit of work until in terms of breaking up the facade and and helping the composition of it um and it's a cost effective means of uh dealing with this thank you uh was there another question i thought i saw rupert oh, has his hand up hi tim uh oh, excuse me i have a couple of roofing questions one sure. is um I, I remember you were talking about moving the roof access for service and i'm wondering mm -hmm. how that interfaces with the revised um roof screen and mm -hmm. then the other question that i have i'll give them both to you at once none of this shows any pv on the roof do you expect pv on the roof to be flush to the roof surface or sloped tilted elevated in some way uh so this roof is sloped at seven degrees and the panels on that roof will be flush to the roof and actually you they are drawn here but they are extremely washed out so it's not fair to say that they are shown accurately um but uh there is a small curb on this roof line so unless you are very far back from the building on the site you most likely will not see pv here you know as Um, but the, the roof itself, the flat roof, the main roof, all of those PV panels are sloped, but they will be high enough that you will not see them from the ground. Um, and then to answer your question about access, I'm going to go back to the plans really quick to show you how to get there. So the... They are not shown on this plan, but this is the third floor. Uh, this is the gym roof where those three air handling units will be. This L shape is actually a small enclosure on the roof where the ducts will exit the air handlers and penetrate the roof. And so from the third floor landing of stair A, there is a door directly to the gymnasium roof. Uh, so that's how those pieces of equipment will be accessed. And then this stair um, is going to continue to the high roof. Uh, so there will be a man door with access directly to the high roof. And there are two more large pieces of equipment on this roof that actually go to this shaft. So all of the major pieces of equipment on the roof, um, there will be direct um, access to from a full stair. Thanks, Tim. That's very helpful. I but, I also have to say that's actually quite good access. So nice job, team. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> they no, only some people came to. We visited one school where you had to climb a vertical ladder um, to get to which, the roof, which is very common, sadly. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, Rupert, but if you do have to get on the music room roof, you will have to probably use a ladder. But that's a, a small portion of the entire roof. So, and there's no equipment there, so we're not perfect. Oh, um, oh my God, I'm so disappointed. I am going to switch to uh, some videos that show uh, the exterior, and then uh, some work and what we have on the interior. Can I just so, comment that it looks like Tammy has also joined the meeting. Tammy, yeah, can you can you hear us? And she might have to do the same thing of clicking right next to the mute button. Tammy, there's an up arrow, and then you can choose computer audio or something. Something worked for Allison. At first, we couldn't hear her. Um, so I don't know if you can hear me. I yes, finally right like there. figured everything out. I couldn't hear anybody. It was, anyways. Finally got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now, so we're gonna take a path similar to one that we have taken around the building before. Here you can see uh, probably the most noticeable difference would be the lack of the metal panels near the punch windows and the masonry at the music room instead of metal panel. Um, there is a lot of opportunity to adjust those patterns and those colors and, and we think it will you know, provide uh, 
the look that we're going for in terms of the. Uh, so right now, um, this is partially updated to the current site plan. Uh, the area that is underneath the camera in green is where the playground would be. It should not be rendered at gra as grass, I apologize, but this view is the view you would get from the center of the soft surface play area. Uh, much of the facade on the eastern side of the building is as you have seen it before. Um, and then I want to really point out that these fences are incorrectly modeled. Um, they uh, are should only be at the eastern edge of the uh, basketball areas. The fence to the north and south are not there. The fence is only to stop the ball from going to the stormwater features. Um, this is the view while elevated from the area where the outdoor learning pavilion and planter gardens will be. And then we're going to, Rupert, um, this shows the stair B extended to the roof. So on the back side of this structure, there is a door that would get you to the rooftop equipment that you cannot see here because it's actually not that large. The screened in service area and the gym. Um, this is a little washed out, so you can't see the contrast mason and the material at the roof edge, but there it is. And then again, um, uh, this is the first time that we've shown this masonry patterning, and uh, maybe someone likes it, maybe someone hates it, but there is a, a world of possibilities there that we think we can come to with the building design subcommittee that will, um, you know, get us the right composition on this facade and, and do it within the budget and the durability requirements that everyone has for the project. Uh, now we're gonna go into the project areas. We talked a little bit about them at the last design subcommittee. Um, we talked about taking the mill work that separates the project areas outside of the classrooms and doing two seating areas. And we don't think we have this finalized yet, but um, we've sort of doubled the sort of seating inches. Um, and we can talk about the proportion, shape and size. Um, I think Allison mentioned that they were maybe a little too large because uh, you know, a kid wants a, a little privacy in there, but maybe we have one large, one small, but we've uh, developed this to capture the cost. Uh, Jonathan, did you have a question? Or did I not see that? No, I just needed to find the unmute button. I just wanted to say, I, I like the way you're developing those. I'm sure we'll talk about them some more, but I like, like how you kind of angled them out now. You can kind of see them as you come down the corridor. I think that's a nice touch. Um, and then oh, the, the color changes, I should mention, um, you know, there are a lot of surfaces here that are um, inherently um, flexible in terms of color. The lockers are painted metal um, and that might not be, and the face on the storage above the lockers is PLAM. Uh, right now it's rendered as wood, which would be a, a assimilation of wood, but it could be any color. And then all of this soffit material is essentially painted gypsum. Uh, so uh, we just showed a few here and the lights themselves. Um, but we know we have to have a discussion about wayfinding and identity of the spaces of the building. So this is just one of the ways that we could uh, incorporate that. And then here we are in the media center with the uh, circulation desk at your right as you come in, which is different than you have seen in the past. The rest of the library is similar. Uh, the uh, group learning space is ahead by the glass. And then there's soft seating over there, the teacher workroom. The lighting um, is what we started to develop and, and we think that captures enough flexibility and for cost, but it is a, a language of spheres and pendant rings that um, we think work in just about all of the spaces in the building modified in some ways. So there's like a lot of color and a lot of um, volume hanging from the roof uh, ceiling, excuse me, that will allow us to do some playful things. Um, and here it is in the cafeteria with a uh, series of ceiling clouds, uh, ceiling elements that are uh, dish shaped that hang below the main ceiling to, uh, to give it a little more geometry shape and interest. Uh, and Jellica, did you have a question? Was that what I saw? Yes, yes, sorry. Um, my, it's hard to see with my bookcases always, but um, I just uh, wanted to go back to the li library because 
I didn't see sort of where if you could go back to the where it might be like the reading area. Um, I know that in um, Port River and in Wawa, they have this like little area where the librarians will read to to the kids. Is there like a seating or lower ground reading area? There is, and I'm sorry we did not uh, push the camera over to that part of the library um, for this particular video, but you can just see the hint of it here. Um, so there's a space uh, with with the uh, bookcases pulled away, and we have uh, soft furniture uh, arranged there. Great, thank you. It is hard to see, but um, there's one, two, three, four, five bookshelves in the far corner, and there's only two, you know, two, two, I guess, maybe three. So there's there's a substantial amount of space. You just can't see it in the video. Got it. Yeah. Um, um, a comment on the library, but also I wanted to go back to the project area in a second. Um, I, I think all of those shelves, the short shelves move. So it also allows, that is correct. It allows reconfiguration if you had a bigger group or you wanted to create more of these spaces. It, it yeah. is correct that they move. I, I, I will also add that moving them is not something that you would undertake on a daily or frequent basis. Uh, but that, that being said, they are movable. So in the project area, what you showed us when we were at the subcommittee over you because you removed some file cabinets you had room to build can you can people see it you brought a window down that and a whiteboard between them which was i thought a nice addition to the project area to make it a project area um yeah. 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 so the idea is that oh, sorry i'm going a little too fast here that <laughs> as a child or or anyone walking down the corridor um so you have a connection to the outside at a, an open door or a large side light. You can see directly through the classroom to the outside. Moving through, um, there are instances uh, where the, the clear story window to the classroom um, breaks in the millwork between the corridor and the project areas, give you glimpses. Uh, you know, it, it's not a window that you can look at and, and contemplate the outside, but it is gives you hints and, and, a, and a real connection. Uh, but these project areas themselves, yes, we've um, taken a few lockers out. We've given a writing surface. Um, there is a task uh, chairs and tables. There is a whiteboard on the inside and tack surface on the other. And these boxes are designed as places where um, a child could sit and read or just uh, do whatever uh, they uh, wanted to do there. Uh, this is rendered with a little bit of storage up here, but I don't know that that is really workable. Um, but uh, you know, as we get into this with the staff and the design subcommittee, we can really define what this thing wants to be. Um, you know, how to sit on it, how to engage with it, and uh, how it shapes the space. You know. Um, up to this point, it was uh, sort of rectal and you're just a straight line down the hall, as Jonathan said, and we've, we've tried to add a little movement into it. And then I think. So that language of lighting circles on the uh, ceiling plane continues looking through from the corridor and lobby into the gymnasium. There's still work certainly to be done about the details around the aperture of the stage. Um, Kathy. Uh, do, do, do Sean first since I mm -hmm. got to speak. Oh, yeah, it's not a big thing. I just, yeah, I've seen in some mostly movies. Um, where sometimes kids can write on the glass with, uh, with you know, certain types of dry erase and you know, almost have the whiteboard be see-through. Um, is, is that an option? Or is there pros and cons to that? Uh, is it different certain types of glass that allow for that uh, to happen more easily? Um, if, if this element were a, a frosted glass, I, I mean, it's certainly possible. Um, I, there's probably a cost consideration versus okay. uh, a typical whiteboard, uh, but we would uh, love to hear any suggestions about what this space really wants to be from the people who are going to use it. 
if it was processed right now, it would feel a little more um, open, do you think? A little more light come, would come through? Uh, prob I, I, yes, I, I do. <laughs> I do think that. So, so I think, I think, Sean, are, are you, are you referring to which whiteboard? The one, I, I this, think this large this one? one? Yeah. So, yeah, that well, it could be any, I mean, it could be in the cafeteria or if there's any clubs or anything like that happening there, yeah. or it could be this project space as well. If it's a huge cost, obviously, you know, you have to be mindful of that, but if it's, Nah, it might be. I don't know. I'd let other people weigh in whether they think that's a good idea or not. Yeah, I think I think that's it's a um, kind of a creative and clever approach to it. I think what that wall really serves is tax surface, where you know each class can provide or display their artwork, the kids' faces, their names. You know, they have different themes throughout the year. They do you know, my family is type of thing. So I think we would defer to Allison and Tammy if they feel that this tax surface is important because there isn't much other place in the project area to display um, class work. And we can circle back with them. Oh, go for it, Tammy. Thanks. Um, I, for one, uh, really appreciate this extended, um, whether it's a whiteboard or tack area, because one, it could serve um, as a way to simultaneously use it as a whiteboard to show something um, if we have uh, like a projector out there, um, and then the whiteboard space to write up problems. But uh, uh, students frequently work with like large newsprint, um, so I, I think it offers a lot more plus, to be honest, like if there's a class walking down, it also serves as a di distract, like a deterrent for distraction. So I apologize, folks. This is the moment I've got to jump. So um, I'll catch up with you all later. And thank you and happy Labor Day. Allison, Allison has her hand up also. Um, is that, I, I didn't hear if it was magnetized because a lot of our whiteboards are magnetized. So I would have assumed it was. Uh, the yes. whiteboards we spec are, yes. Yeah. So yeah, that, that gives you options. You don't have to write on it. You can use little magnets to take, put work up. Um, yeah, as long as it has a magnetic function, I think that'll be fine. I'm not a big fan of bulletin boards personally. Just it's, it's not usable enough. And um, I think if it's a whiteboard, you can still put work up, you can work on it. You can, it's just, it serves a lot of multi-purposes. Bulletin boards, I feel are too static and trying to help them be more interactive is something I'd want us to go towards if I had my choice, but I don't wanna, um, I think Tammy, I don't wanna speak for Tammy. I just, it's a personal thing. Sure, and, and we can further have those conversations when we start talking about the interior kind of materials, colors, et cetera, with the um, subgroup. So that's great, thank you. So I have a completely different question. Um, the lights in all of these places, are they dimmable? So if it was not so much, well, even these, so if it was a really nice sunny day, could the cafeteria lights be half masked um, and controlled by the teachers or controlled centrally? Um, yes, uh, the lights are controllable. They're dimmable. Um, standard spec for classrooms is there's a lighting control that will dim at the very least the outermost pendant. Um, but light harvesting um, is certainly something that will be programmed into, I think it's actually I think code required, uh, the uh, lighting control package. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, this last little bit is, um, where the interior movie is all that we have. I mean, we have the lighting laid out in the lobby itself and we are looking at moving the seating or a soft seating area toward the door, um, but we don't have anything rendered to show you on that. Uh, but we have um, 
we changed the lighting to the rings and the spheres uh, to be consistent with the language in the rest of the building. And we do think that it will like the space. Um, it will be objects that define the space. And then um, with the clear story glass and the glass at the end of the building, uh, it will sort of function and be visible from the outside in darker times, so almost like a lantern. Angelica has Angelica. Her uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there will be some in the, in the future rendering, some um, showing us a little bit about the spaces in the front, because that's one mm -hmm. of the questions I had. Um, I know uh, people, uh, folks had been raising, uh, like they wanted to see some kind of little lobby area or little area for parents to help transition their kids when they're inside. I think a, a nice model for that was like uh, Crocker Farm Elementary. They have like two little areas where after you get into the main administration, you have like uh, two little areas where there's like three or so couches and it's a nice area to help transition kids, uh, especially you now uh, for, for, kid, for folks who, who with kids with special needs, it helps us to, to have some place to sit and help with the transitions as kids are, are, are dealing with that. And I wanted to see if there would be a space like that or if it's just, uh, if it's just going to be furniture or if it's like a little bit kind of more like the Crocker Farm model where they have that little lobby, it's like a little lobby in the in the back. We are we are looking at uh, a seating area, something in in the main lobby. Uh, I, I don't know that we don't have space in in the building to dedicate a room, uh, but we are certainly looking as how we can carve out a niche or an area that is away from you know the the stimulation of the the, the glass uh, cafeteria and toward the front seat. That's the front door as you're coming directly into the building. And as we develop that, we will certainly bringing it to the design subcommittee and the larger group. Thanks. Tim, at, in terms of, other than the beauty of the building, the, what's in between the walls, the code change, the t code change to Teddy, when we're mm -hmm. getting the next, when we're getting the next estimate, this came up at the last sustainability committee when you explained this. Um, it was an issue of did you add to, have to add insulation? Did you have to go to triple pane glass? Did you have to go to triple on mm -hmm. all windows? Is that all going to be part of this next estimate? That that is all going to be part of this next estimate, and we uh, the the most recent but not still entirely complete information that we have from Thornton Comissetti is that we are on the path to meet Teddy. We are going to have alternates for additional insulation in the exterior walls, uh, some building controls that um, control ventilation tied to CO2 sensors, which make things a bit more efficient. And we are also uh, continuing to carry the alternate for triple pane glass. The most recent uh, Teddy calculations of the Thornton Tomasetti has said that um, double pane glass would actually be better. Um, the reason for that is yes, triple pane glass heats is more insulative. It would do better, but in the cooling season, uh, and that is a lot of the energy used by the building, it actually uses more energy to cool the building because it's keeping the heat in if that makes sense. So the overall energy budget of the building will actually be lower if we use double pane glass with a higher shading coefficient. Uh, so that is going to be the basis of design. And then we're going to do the alternate in case the calculations change. Uh, but uh, yes, we are still carrying the alternates that we have previously discussed, uh, just in you know, when we finally get the final resolution of, of the Teddy calculations. But we we do believe that we are on track. And can you, um, it sounds like we'll be able to see this, you know, to the extent, I mean, every time we say cost estimate, it's like, oh no, not another one of those. Um, <laughs> but to the extent the code change has increased our costs, will you be able to talk us through that when we see them at the end of September? You know, either that we did have to do this or we already, um, it turned yes, out. Uh, yeah, yeah. We we'll, we will be able to talk about um, you know the changes that we just mentioned, the glass and the insulation, whether we need them or not, and then anything mechanically that we had to include that we would not have otherwise. Okay. But some, you know, and but that is 
not the whole picture. There's certainly a lot that is just good practice that helps us get to the code. So it, 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 it will, we will walk you through it, but it will be a nuanced conversation. Thank you. Um, and that, that is the synopsis that we have. We are submitting drawings to our cost estimator next Friday. Uh, as Margaret mentioned, there's a three week process. And after that, we will know where we are and hopefully be right on target. So Margaret's not here to, to walk us through the agenda, um, but the two other items in addition to the invoices was a quick report. I think Jonathan, if you can give it verbally that we talked about or I can do it, but the subcontract under the answer contract for the um, the uh, net zero consultant, saying we're on track to net so, and it's in everybody's pa packet. Just we had a discussion on that, and then there were a few things we received him over the and Donna over the time period on public comments. There was one on a question about an alternative surface for the uh, port in place. And then Angelica, there were some that came in from CPAC. So just if we could maybe do the Jonathan one first, just to make sure we bring it to the full committee. Um, it, these aren't for votes. This is just for strong recommendation and moving forward. Yeah, right. Jonathan. I, I'm, I'm gonna lean on you a little bit, Kathy, because it's been <laughs> multiple weeks at this point, but we did have a, I think a good, conversation about the proposed uh, contract from answer to do the um, the third party kind of review of the and development of the the checklists uh, for meeting the net zero bylaw. Um, and I think that the subcommittee felt like it was a, a good proposal and, and was supportive of it. And, and it's already been built in, Sean, you can double, I can double check. It's been built into the larger answer contract so moving forward with that means that the at the sustainability when we schedule which we don't have it scheduled yet um the consultant could come in with the proposed checklist and this is really to as she starts to go through uh the existing plans but particularly as we get closer to construction with the construction documents what she's going to be looking at so she laid that out that is in the package so I'm right, Sean, right, that the price tag is already in as a subcontract? Yeah, so the, there's a placeholder for the peer review already within the OPM's contract. Um, our conversation was more about who would, would do that. Um, just, you know, typically we don't weigh in on subconsultants for our major contractors as we're not contracted with them directly. Um, but, but there were questions about this one and what it would look like. And because it's a new process, um, we had a good conversation about what that process would look like. There was a back and forth um, to hopefully address some of the questions about it. Um, and I think, yeah, today we're looking for, you know, are we good to move forward because we want to get the, the sub-consultant on uh, working with the OPM um, as quickly as possible. And we, we voted unanimously to say move forward and to recommend to the full committee. And um, there's a zoom of it. I, Margaret was taking notes. I don't think we have the notes yet, but that the vote was unanimous of the, the sustainability. So, you know, I'm not, as Sean said, we don't typically even look at subcontracts. So this is just to enable us to move forward. It will provide a, a model for the town for other buildings um, going forward. So I think it's a good precedent we're setting. So Paul, I, you know, I'm comfortable either way of just saying we, this is our strong recommendation. I didn't put it on for a vote because it's a subcontract, but I wanted to let people know that um, the, the yeah. committee about it. Yeah, I think know. we were mostly looking for if, if there's any objections at this point. Again, this is a contract between the OPM and their consultant. Um, Thank you. Service. And I think, you know, the comments I received were we need to talk about this more and have a, a longer discussion, which we did at the sustainability subcommittee. So what we're really looking for is if anyone objects to moving forward with the, um, the proposal that was submitted, um, and if not, you know, we would we would move forward, or they, oh, the OPM would move forward. Don't see any. Um, you know, we we received the initial public comment. Everyone received it, and that's what 
then then we we had the subcommittee meeting. I mean, there was a strong endorsement of this. So I think it looks like we're good to go on it then is what I would say. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. So Donna or Tim on the other two issues that were raised that we said we would try to address at this meeting. I mean, we did all yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so um, just, just let me know if I don't address all of them. Um, I, I think one of the questions was the parking for parents um, to be able, this is kind of in response to CPAC, these, these responses um, that there, we created that separate parking area for, for parents to park, to be able to take their time with their, with their children or students as, as they bring them into the school. So I think we um, pretty much addressed that. The, there was another question I'm just reading, so that's why I'm not looking at you, so I apologize. Um, there was also, I think, uh, a question or request to also provide additive parking in the parking lot for parents to also um, be able to park and then walk their students into the school and maybe even their classrooms. And this really um, needs to be an operational discussion that that needs a needs to be a policy from the schools and how that's going to be handled, not just for parents with students that um, need more time or special needs, but if it, you know, does that apply to the whole community, right? So it really kind of gets into an overarching operational discussion. So, but we are really happy to say that we were able to provide that cutout for um, those students that really do require that additional time. There's a question about mirrors or um, so, so to create either mirrors or kind of a closed circuit TV or something so that parents could observe and watch their students in the classroom. Um, that, that is, not allowed to the best of our understanding, both from a teacher contract or from an operational perspective. So I, I think I would have to defer to the school department to respond to that further, but it's our understanding that that's just not uh, allowed. Um, and then it goes the same with the cameras, whether it was you know one-way mirrors or cameras to be able to observe their students in the classroom. So I believe those are not allowed and if um, more information is needed or requested, you know, we can have maybe that offline conversation with the school department. Um, we talked about the STEAM, the music, uh, the um, STEM or STE room, switching with the art. So we think that's great. And I think the last question might've been Kathy about the port in place play area or play surface after a lot of discussion, review, evaluation, it's been determined that the really only fully accessible surface is this port in place that we did spend a lot of time evaluating the um, wood fiber, the engineered wood fiber material, and it is not fully accessible. In fact, a lot of the material that these manufacturers put out actually recommend that we put like rubber mats and stuff underneath the equipment that is used frequently so that it preserves or provides longevity to that surface. So um, I we're gonna stay with the port in place because we feel it is the most uh, universally accessible material for all students. And it's also porous. I just wanna make sure everyone understands it's not hard, um, impervious, it is porous. So we really, believe that provides all, all of the attributes that we're looking for. Did I miss any question? And, and then Angelica, the other thing was the parent waiting area. So we're developing that as well. Angelica, I think you you raised your hand, so. Uh, no, I first wanted to, to express my, my deep thanks to, um, to you all for incorporating that parking. That's like incredible news and we're so excited. Um, I think that addresses a real big need. 
So thank you so much. Um, yeah, you have huge advocates, Allison yeah, and Tammy. That, that we're out wonderful. there, and yeah, yeah. And and I completely, I think we part of the discussion we had um, when we did the site visit was about the additive parking. And it was great to hear also the perspective from the school principals. So definitely, that was that's part of uh, you know great to hear. That's going to be part of a discussion, and it's definitely something that there's some some significant cons to that. I I did want to raise uh, some updates with the glass um, question. Um, cause it's, it's actually not about mirrors. It's about glass. So the question was basically how can, um, the existing design help address or facilitate observations that are part of, uh, legal rights of parents with students with IEPs and 504s. So by, by law, by the idea, we have the legal right to parent observations of our students. So it's, it's, it's so part of the concern and part of that was part of the pandemic has been that it's, it's been a challenge to do those observations, partly because, you know, it's been a challenge to get into the buildings. And now mm -hmm. as we're moving away from the pandemic, it's also a challenge with certain parts, certain of our learners uh, in programs, because um, being there to observe would be a disruption to their learning. So the question, that's where I just wanted to contextualize where the concerns about like, well, several approaches uh, are available broadly. Um, one would be having cameras and another one would be having um, through the mirrors in the classrooms because the design itself has a lot of mirrors, which is wonderful for light, but maybe there's a possibility of using that design uh, through a, like a two-way mirror as a way of allowing for non-disruptive observations. So, um, and some of those models uh, we looked at was for instance in Worcester, Nelson Price Elementary has a one-way mirror glass with audio for both sub-separate and general education classrooms. So there are nearby models and I'm happy to send information hmm. to those nearby models. So we wrote to, um, to I'm sorry, not we, uh, Faye, uh, Faye Brady uh, kindly wrote to Mike Morris and we received a response um, in mid-August that said that these topics would be part of an upcoming agenda in the school, um, and, and, and I think either here or this, uh, that this is not a decision for, I'm sorry, he said, I'm trying to read this. Okay. So he says that it, this will become a part, a part of an upcoming agenda in the, um, in, in the SBC and that the issue of the cameras would need to be a, a district decision given the broad implications. And I guess our concern is to figure out some clarity about is it a teacher contract issue or is it a district decision? Because in other districts, it has been approved. And if so, what would be the process for having this part of the a decision uh, or a policy recommendation? Um, you know, given also that there's a lot of upheaval right now with the school committee about how it's functioning and when what would be coming up. So I guess we have just a lot of questions about um, clarity about whether this is uh, teacher contract issue or um, school committee issue or how the decision making would happen on the possibility of this or at least certain classroom spaces like the ILC aims and building blocks. So I, Allison, your hand is up. Hi, I just wanted to offer because there are a few concerns. And so, yes, there are some um, things that I would want to make sure that we work with our teacher union on because there are concerns around being filmed that was strictly expressed during the pandemic. And so that would be something that would need to be discussed. The other issue is um, and when it comes to the cost of changing the, the actual building, that is something that is a concern. So I'm wondering if, as we are moving forward, I wonder if there is a type of furniture, like a, a mirror that could be put in the room rather than building a whole wall. Um, it's just a thought, I like to, be aware of the different options because we do have families who come, um, parents who come in and observe. That's not the issue. And I hear Angelica saying that trying to observe without it causing a disruption for certain students is, is something that is the concern. And so I'm wondering if there's a piece of equipment that would help with that concern as opposed to changing the building itself because the cost of changing the building could be prohibitive in this experience. So those are just my thoughts. Um, the filming part, I just know that there's a lot of other things to that because then it took for us to get to remote learning, it took work um, to get to that point. 
And so I'm not sure where we would be in, in working with the union on that piece. So those are just my thoughts at this time. Paul. Yeah, so I, I, I just want to support what Allison said that, you know, I think that I worry about making permanent changes in the structure of the building for a function that we might, I worry about sort of indiscriminate indiscriminate observation when you really want to control who is, you know, if it's a parent who has the um, um, authority to observe versus someone walking down the hall or something. I mean, I, I know there's contractual issues with film, with uh, cameras or, you know, but I think that that might be, gives you more flexibility in terms of being able to observe remotely. But I know there's union issues with that, but it also lets you position cameras or turn them off paper. It's 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 easier to install cameras and de uninstall cameras versus once you put in some big piece of glass um, that might be very expensive and then you say oh we sh we we don't want it we can't use that now because of something or other so I just think we in our role as school building committee we should be deciding on flexibility for so that the school committee can make the decision that it can, it needs to make down the road. Angelica. Thanks so much for those clarifications, Allison. I think it really helps um, to, to get a sense of exactly what the teacher contract issue meant. Because certainly, if this is a union, that that's that's a big concern. Um, I like the furniture idea, and I think I I think it would be great to um, continue the conversation about what could be because certainly there's a lot of cost issues at stake. But there's also some things where I I, I don't necessarily see that it's a cost of changing the actual building because. Uh, it, you know, if it's an issue about in like three classrooms doing a one way mirror, it doesn't seem it seems like the designs there. Everything's beautiful about the design. It just would be about adding a different kind of glass. And since we were talking about glass and different panes, it would just be it would be great to just continue in that conversation and see what would be the cost of, say, uh, in certain classrooms doing a one way glass um, to allow for greater observations uh, or what would be that furniture mirror possibility of allowing for non-disruptive observations. Um, so yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you for your ideas. And um, Angelica, um, we toured Nelson Place as, it's called Nelson Place, right? Nelson Place as well, I think. Um, and what we saw, and we also saw at Sunita Williams and other school in um, Needham, was they had the one-way mirrors or you, know, you be, being able to look into the room for, at the de-escalation rooms, but we hadn't seen them for the, any of the general classrooms. So if you know, I, I would love to explore this more and understand what they use. So if you do know of it, um, and there is someone over there that could speak to it, that, that would be huge if, if you have a, con you, you mentioned that you've been there. So that would be really helpful. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands up on this. Um, yeah, and Donna, I do remember the one and it was one small room that had a, it was either a wall or it was translucent, um, but it was a small, right. there were no inner quarter quarter windows into classrooms at all um they no were, that was the, yeah, that was the they, were, they, were, they were solid walls yeah right so i think we have invoices and i want to make be conscious of people's time and we do have people in the public so sean did, did margaret send you the invoices yeah um let's see if i can share I think I enabled everyone to share. So that would include you. Can you see the invoice on your screen? Yes, Is I can. Is large enough to read? I'm not. Yeah, yes, it's fine. Out, yeah, it looks right. fine to me. OK, so we have two invoices from uh, Answer, our OPM, and we have one invoice from Danesco, um, the designer. So this first one um, from Answer is for the month of June. It's for the amount of $6,770. Um, as a reminder, our OPM contract is sort of a hours build type arrangement where our designer contract is a more of a flat fee. We pay sort of based on the phase. So, so these invoices are always gonna fluctuate from month to month. 
Um, and at this phase, they're relatively small. The, you'll start to see these ramp up and be more extensive during construction. Um, unlike with the designer, where their, their fee is more front-loaded as they're doing the design and wanes a little bit once we get to construction. Um, so this first one is for 6770 As always, they provide the backup um, as to who's doing what. Again, we have three people really working right now. Margaret uh, Kasenya, who does a lot of sort of management management behind the scenes type work, um, and Bob Stevens. The next one is for the month of July, 11,220. Same thing in terms of the backup. And then the last one is for uh, NISCO. So we're done with feasibility and schematic design and all the reimbursables associated with that um, component. Now we're into this next phase. So we're in design development. This is what was in our contract, 1,489,000. Um, the last full meeting, we approved their first two invoices for the months of, um, I believe it was May and June. And so this invoice is for July, and again, sort of equal increments um, each month. So a base fee of 297800 for this month, and then there were some reimbursables um, uh, charges. So a reimbursable for the lead registration and certification um, for some of the Eversource consulting services that we're doing um, in order to get the incentives. And um, Donna, if anyone has questions, she probably can explain more what this is. I assume this is related to the energy, um, the energy modeling or the, the structure of the building and bringing on somebody to look at that. Um, so total reimbursable services of, of 8,900. So the total fee between the reimbursable and the base for design development is 306,700 for the months of uh, for the month of July. And they attach all their documentation as well. Invoices from the consultants they're working with. The reimbursables. Sorry, I keep. Rolling back on me. They have their workforce participation as well. I, I move to approve the invoices as presented. I'll second. Thank you. Um, one thing when I put it to vote, I want to point out, I think I'm right, Sean. If, when we're approving this, this is partially billed to MSBA now. Is that yeah, so really starting with the last meeting, um, all the invoices after schematic design um, will be billed to the MSBA for reimbursement. So we'll start getting, you know, 60% roughly reimbursement for all those invoices. Um, when I leave, I've uh, shown uh, Jennifer LaFountain, who's the town's treasurer collector, and she's been in the town for over 20 years. Um, super, uh, super solid person, does a lot for the town. She's going to take on my role in terms of managing the invoices and uh, managing sort of our tracking spreadsheet, working with the OPM on contracts and billing. Um, so I brought her up to speed. Um, she may join this committee at some point in the future to kind of, to, again, with, for continuity purposes. Um, but as of right now, she's working with me behind the scenes to get, keep everything moving. So there won't be any drop off in terms of, uh, sort of managing the financial piece of the project. Thank you. So if any other comments, otherwise I'm putting it to a vote. Okay, um, Shane votes yes. Jonathan? Yes. Paul? Yes. Allison? Tammy? Yes. John? Yes. Angelica? Yes. Phoebe? Yes. Simone? Yes. And Rupert? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you, Sean. Are there any other comments? As I said, I will poll people to make sure that November 3rd date works. And then if it does work, Margaret will put a hold on people's comments, uh, calendars. So at this point, if I don't see any hands, 
and everyone knows this is going to cost estimates, I'm going to open it up to public comments. So we have five people. I was asked to, to announce this. I didn't at the beginning, but we have five people, Chris Riddle, Rudy Perkins, Bruce Caldman, Maria Capepe, and Tony Cunningham. And um, I will uh, bring the first person in. Uh, um, we already did. Rudy and Kathy. Rudy thank you. you. Thank you, Rudy. Hi, you. thanks, Rudy Perkins. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, as I mentioned at the um, sustainability committee hearing, by the way, the school looks fantastic. So thank you so much for keeping up the good work. And we're going to be so proud of this school, uh, I'm sure. But um, on the energy front. As I mentioned at the sustainability committee, uh, subcommittee, um, the 2018 changes in the bylaw were in essence a compromise that took us from a performance-based review of whether the, the building met compliance with our bylaw to a modeling-based review, which depended on the certification by the architect that the building, if built, as per the construction documents, would meet the um, definition of zero energy capable. And that as a backstop to that, that there would be a peer reviewer that would confirm that that was also true, that the building if built per the construction documents would meet our definition of zero energy capable. As I pointed out in the subcommittee meeting, this contract is a bit fuzzy to, to put it generously about how that uh, role, that confirmation, the peer review confirming the section F uh, E2 confirmation per the bylaw would occur. And since you guys have decided to go with it, I think it's gonna be incumbent on the ESBC to closely review the reports from the peer reviewer and make sure that an actual confirmation per the requirement of our bylaw in section E2, that the building will meet the definition of zero energy capable if uh, constructed per the construction documents, that that is stated unequivocally in the report at some point so that we know we have compliance. We need those two things to know we have compliance, the certification of the architect to that effect and the confirmation by the peer reviewer to, to that effect. And since the contract is not gonna get us there very precisely. I think the, the committee or the subcommittee on sustainability are really going to have to pay careful attention and discuss those for the public, those reports coming up, um, so that we know that our building complies. Um, secondly, I wanted to know where are we at in the energy modeling and the assessment of whether the PV uh, capacity that we've planned are going to match or, or be exceeded by the PV. I don't, I couldn't find a report from TT about it. And it sounds like they're still working on that. And yet we're sending design development documents to the, you know, MSBA, uh, to the cost estimator shortly. We'll need to know that we've got all the elements in for PV, for example, that will allow us to comply with the bylaw. So I, at some point, it'd be good to see those reports, preferably in a subcommittee meeting where they could be discussed. Um, thirdly, just on the peer reviewer again, that, that peer reviewer is supposed to be making a report, um, at the DD level. And I don't think ha has that report been done yet. How do we know that, that the peer reviewer is confirming at per the subcontract that was proposed? I think they're, uh, they proposed reviewing and reporting at several dis different stages, including hundred percent DD. So I'm wondering when we're gonna get that report so that we know, or we at least have a strong confirmation that the, the building is gonna meet our bylaw. Um, so I, I hope that these items will be addressed. I haven't seen anything really discussing the plug load and the equipment loads and the uh, kitchen equipment models and what they're gonna draw. Um, I'm eager to see all that. To, because our bylaw talks about making sure our PV has the capacity to carry all those loads. And they haven't been discussed in any detail. They've just been a, 
an approximate fraction given. So um, I hope the sustainability committee will meet, will discuss these things and will review the peer review reports um, carefully in front of the public for public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Um, are you managing this, Sean, or do you want me to? I'll just bring the next person in. Okay, Chris, I think I've held, allowed you to talk. I am talking. Um, uh, let's see, I'm talking to, to a, a mask. So, uh, we haven't left uh, the pandemic behind. Let's see, I agree with what Rudy just said. I would just want to second that. I always seem, tend, seem to do that, but he's, he's the guy that does the careful analysis. And my feeling is that letter of the bylaw here, at least not with the intent of it, but I'm not sure we've complied with the letter of it. It's um, all done. Again, and if we're, if we're not going to, if we're not going to get the kind of we're, Chris, we're having a little, at least I'm having a little bit of your, something is getting garbled. Um, so ask I just took off my code. One possibility might be to write an email to us and then I will I'll make sure everyone gets it. Um mm -hmm. but you can try again. At least I'm having trouble and so the recording won't capture what you're saying either. That doesn't help, huh? No, sorry. Thank you. It's there's there's something like it's it's like you're underwater. Um, it's the way best way I can describe it. It's mm -hmm. it's just it's the words are distorted. Um, One more attempt. It's a little it's not, better. That's a little better. Yes. Just a minute. Sorry about this. <laughs> Uh oh. Is that any better? A little? No, a that's little. better. A little. A little. I mean, say a few say a few words what you're trying to say, and we'll tell I'll tell you whether we can. You know, let's go and see four fathers up there from this. Okay. Is that okay? No, it's not working. I will try again some other time. I'll send you an email. Yeah, just send me, I, I assure you, I will share it with everyone, um, including the design team. Thank you. Sorry, it didn't work. Maria. Hi there. Are we good? Yes. Okay. Um, so first, I would like to um, uh, say a lot of thank yous and um, and uh, to, to Tim and, and the Danisco team. I mean, it is looking beautiful. Thank you for all your work on that. Um, Sean, thank you for pointing out, um, for talking about and having making sure the committee dis, uh, considers getting more PV uh, canopies in the northern part of the sites and for thinking about other town uses. And don't forget, we um, will hopefully have field lighting and a comfort station in that northern part. So hopefully if uh, PV can power that, that would be great. Uh, thank you uh, to Tim for um, making all the efforts and preserving as much athletic field as you can up there in that northern part. And uh, while you do your stormwater uh, runoff capture, not letting that impact it. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you for uh, making sure about uh, we think about the EV charging and to maximize that. Um, great call there. Uh, Kathy, thank you for making sure that we get the cost estimates specifically about meeting the stretch codes. That's important not only for this project, but for other projects. Um, so that's super important. Big thank you to Angelica. I'm not going to um, repeat everything you said, but for continuing to advocate uh, for CPAC and for all of those issues. Thank you for doing that. And please continue. Um, I had a quick question. Um, and I don't know if this is feasible or not, but there's that south facing wall, the exterior wall of the gym. And I'm wondering if uh, it's hard to get a sense of size and, and appropriateness, but 
a lot of different sports you need to like bounce things off of walls like i've seen like the lacrosse people do that i do worry a little bit because there's glass nearby but i'm just wondering um if you could uh if the designers could weigh in about is that a possible future thing for off school hours because obviously you wouldn't want to do that with the buses there and 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 so on but if you could take a peek at that um thank you to rudy uh, for continuing to uh, advocate uh, for making sure that we are net zero and and everything that you said. Uh, I do want to ask um, a, a follow-up question. Uh, Donna talked about the engineered wood fiber not uh, being fully accessible. That is not my understanding from all the reading and um, stuff that I've done. It is certainly not consistent with what's on the TURI site, the Toxic Use uh, Use Reduction Institute. Um, could you please provide the evidence and sources for um, for what you said today about engineered wood fiber? I would still like to see the port in place gone um, in, in favor of engineered wood fiber. Um, and one other question there, uh, I talked about that circle that includes the two half courts and whether that the diameter of that circle could be made smaller. And forgive me if I missed that in, in the presentation. I don't think it was mentioned, but I think that um, uh, it, it, I think that could happen and still preserve everything you need to do with it, uh, certainly with the other spaces that we have for, for outdoor play. So if, if we could minimize that circle with the two half courts, that would be great. Um, again, thank you very much. Uh, it is definitely looking very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Bruce. Bruce, I think you're, you're, you've been yes, allowed. Yes. I'm good. Um, I echo Maria's and others, Rudy's and Chris's comments about uh, how successfully I think this project is continuing to evolve. And um, uh, it's, it's always just wonderful. I enjoy these meetings for that reason, mostly, I think. Um, Rudy and I are always talking about this uh, net zero bylaw and so forth. And, and I, I, I support all his uh, comments and so forth, but I want to remind him, as I have before and 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 all of you all, that there's a limit to what professionals, uh, design professionals can do when it comes to attesting to the uh, uh, the performance of something because uh, there are insurance limitations, liability insurance limitations on design professions. We're all we're insured and so forth, but the 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 um, Validity of that insurance depends on us uh, behaving appropriately and guaranteeing things is not something that design professionals can do. So Rudy's aspiration that uh, uh, that a peer reviewer can uh, make uh, perhaps the level of guarantees that he's uh, suggesting uh, is uh, circumscribed by the uh, um, what the prescriptions of liability professional liability insurance um, um, covers. So just bear that in mind uh, when uh, you might receive something that appears to be a little less than uh, 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 completely uh, um, uh, uh, anything like a guarantee, because that is not possible to be delivered. Um, and uh, I, I think I'm get, I got the impression that this uh, project will go to the planning board uh, sometime in late October or early November, which pleases me because... Uh, I um, don't, I'm a member of the planning board these days, and I certainly would like to be able to uh, be a part of the conversation there. But I'm uh, I'm going to be in Europe until uh, late October, and I'm not sure whether I can uh, match Kathy's uh, performance when it comes to participating in uh, town committee Zoom meetings from the other side of the Atlantic. So uh, to the extent that that happens, uh, that the planning board is scheduled in uh, later October or beyond, that will make it uh, a lot easier for me to uh, support my colleagues in understanding this process because, of course, I've been to practically every one of these meetings for the last three years. And and uh, I want to make sure that um, the, uh, the board and the public audience for the board uh, gets a full uh, appreciation for what you all done. And uh, if I'm here in town for that, it's going to happen more effectively than if I'm not. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. 
Um, and I, I want to say just before we, we adjourn, I, I do want to give a huge thank you to the design team and um, Tim and your whole group, if you can make sure, I know you always send this post meeting. I'm going to see whether I can't do an update at a council meeting if we ever have five minutes or something with the pictures. You know, just the 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 town was so strongly behind this building was because of what you've designed and because it's net zero and the excitement for our kids. So just keeping it up to date and it just looks better and better. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just want to thank you all because I, I didn't know what design detail was, but I'm getting a better sense of uh, the next steps on it. So we are, uh, I think, unless I see another hand up, um, I, we are adjourned and the recording for this, we've been, the town staff has been great on putting these Zoom videos up pretty soon after we meet and we meet on Fridays. So they usually post them. So if uh, the one member who wanted to be here, uh, Alicia Walker, she just couldn't uh, do it with the change in the meeting time. She's on a different coast. Um, but I think want to thank everyone for being flexible. So until we meet again. Um, I want to wish you a good end of summer and send any questions or comments to me, including any other thoughts that, that you want the design team to be taking up. Um, I get thoughts after the meeting and I just send them through um, and they put them on their general or specific list. So we are adjourned at 1139 by my wristwatch. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. Have a great weekend. Thank you.